All right. <laughs> the more of these I do, I feel like the better I will get at it. But yeah, we're still, still learning a little bit how all this works. Let me know if you have trouble hearing me. It's a little bit breezy today. It's not terrible, but it might be just enough to kind of mess up the microphone. And if that's the case, I'm not really sure <laughs> what I can do about it uh, beyond finding a different place to set up where hopefully the wind is not as bad. So no video today. I, uh, I apologize for that. I think the last couple days that I normally would have filmed the video that I would have put out today, I just kind of got caught doing stuff that either, you know, takes a long time and is not really all that interesting to film. Uh, we got a bunch of the garden prep work done and then the the pig pen or what we usually use as a pig pen which is now housing bottle calves i had to go through there with my little three-point chisel and try to break all that up and smooth it out because what the pigs did to that pen i mean it looked like a minefield out there there were just big holes everywhere and that clay when it dries it gets so hard so i didn't want to turn the bottle caps loose out there when the ground was like that so i went through with my three-point chisel and got everything broken up and smoothed out so now what you will see in the next video is we, we've got them out so that they're not just locked into that little enclosure there hello everybody i see a bunch of you coming in now thank you thanks for thanks for showing up <laughs> <laughs> so the uh the weather is changing out here if you haven't noticed in the last several videos things are starting to dry out it's starting to feel like spring i think we're going to get into the mid 70s today and then there is another chance of rain in a couple days but after that uh, it looks like we're going to be getting up into the 80s which is going to feel like 100 because we're not used to it yet but I think that it, we've reached the time of year where garden prep is starting to happen. And I didn't really film rototilling that or chiseling it or anything uh, just because I was kind of in a hurry to get it done. And I know I've showed that before. Of course, I've showed a lot of things before that I uh, am showing again. So we'll, we'll probably film planting it, though, because I want to try to get the kids involved in doing that and just kind of learning, you know, about how plants grow, where food comes from, and all that good stuff. So that is the plan moving forward. But this is, it's not a gardening channel. It is uh, a mostly ranching channel, but sometimes we do get into a little bit of self-sufficiency, kind of homesteading type stuff. So yes, life of a YouTube farmer is repeated content. Everything repeats itself but really no two years are the same either, if that makes sense. I did want to talk a little bit about uh, the calf crop this year because that is really what's going on right now, the, the big thing that's happening. And uh, the last several videos about calving uh, have done really well. So I want to thank you guys for, for watching and engaging with those and doing all the things that you do. A lot of people have said that they think Riveter has sired nearly all of the calves this year. And I've, I've probably made it look that way on camera. I realize that because I think that every time I get a calf that is an interesting color or something that's different than the norm, I, I usually film those. But if we just get black calves, then I usually don't. Honestly, I think it's probably about half and half black calves to gray, brown, uh, champagne colored, I learned. That's kind of what, what you call that. I would call it like a light tan. or I mean, it's almost the color that Cali is, like a golden lab color. But uh, we're learning that Riveter can make a lot of different colors. And possibly one of those is black as well. So that's the other thing that I don't really know is when I get black calves, did they come from him or did they come from little boy? This year, it's, uh, it's kind of impossible to say. The plan for next year will be to separate the cows into two separate breeding herds so that we will now know the sire and dam of each calf that is born. 
I've had a couple people caution me against doing this uh, because if, you know, like let's say little boy is having a problem or something along those lines, you know, either one of them, and then half of your cows want to get bred. Well, to kind of mitigate that risk, my plan is to separate the cows for the first like 42 days probably. So that would be two heat cycles. Heat cycle in a cow is 21 days. So if we separate everybody for breeding for the first two heat cycles and then just put everybody together, um, then I, I feel like we pretty well guarantee that we will get everyone bred that way. And then we'll be able to determine from the calendar which calves belong to which bull. In other words, after a certain point in the year, the calves could belong to either. If they have a color difference, that would make it obvious as to which, uh, which sire that they got with. But um, doing it that way, we would minimize the risk of not getting cows bred. And then odds are replacement heifers that we would keep to breed back again would be out of the first calves that are born anyway. So that's kind of the plan with that. So I noticed in the uh, in the the live chat, I was gonna say comment. I guess it's the same thing. People or some, I don't know. I don't know who it was. Somebody asked if I got my concrete done yet. I have not. Everything's ready to go there. The plan is to get that poured on Friday, and that's because I'm gonna have my dad come help me do that. And that was the first day that he was gonna be able to do it. I have poured a 10 by 10 slab a couple years ago. That actually was, I made a video about it. So if you've been with the channel for a while, you saw that. And I kind of decided that I didn't want to pour a big slab like that by myself again. And the main reason is, uh, it, well, this slab for the shoot wouldn't be that bad to do by myself because it's not really wide so to screed it off which if you're not uh if you're not a concrete worker which i am also not but what that means is when you pour the concrete in the form you take a board on top of it and kind of saw it back and forth down the length of the form and that that'll push the big rocks in the concrete down and it'll give the top of your slab a little bit more of a smoother appearance and then you can finish it and get it looking nice which you can do that if you know what you're doing, which I really don't. I just want a mostly sl smooth slab and that's um, kind of how you get there. So this would be easy enough to scrape by myself because it's not very wide, but the, the problem that I run into is the place where I rent the concrete from is like 30 minutes away so by the time I get the concrete poured in the form, get it screeded off, get the mixer cleaned out, get it taken back to the rental place and then get back here to the ranch, it has set up too much to really do the finish work in, in the right time frame. Excuse me. So my dad has offered to run that mixer back for me so I can babysit the concrete while it's setting up. So that's, that's kind of... The plan moving forward and then i don't know probably i should wait a while before i put the shoot on that new slab i'm not really sure i mean probably like 30 days would be the smart amount of time to wait but i really don't have that much time i don't think i i'm hoping i could get away with putting the shoot on there after about two weeks because i need to use it because i need to get the steers shipped to the steer pasture and in order to do that i need to get them branded vaccinated and then i want to get weights on those guys because the whole reason for the experiment that i did last year as far as weighing the steers tracking growth and then kind of figuring out how long it takes to get steers to harvest weight just on grass and hay alone that data does me no good if I ha if I don't have a starting weight to go off of with the steers. So I, I really do kind of need to get them weighed before they head down the road. Mm. Allergies. <laughs> it is allergy season too. So I was actually getting a little bit nervous about 
the live stream today because I've been going around moving cows and doing stuff this morning and my nose was running. I was sneezing because I was out there in the grass and I thought, man, I need to, I need to get out of that for a little while so that I can uh, kind of get my voice back to normal and I'm not just blowing my nose the whole time on here. That would probably not make a very good live stream. <laughs> ah, let me get a drink here. All right, let me go through the chat. Oops, here a little bit. Oh, belly. Hey. I think belly, quit. All right, a lot of people asking about calving. Belly, stop. So I think Belly hears the train. I don't know. She's, um, you know, German Shepherd. She's a good watchdog. She's not very, she's not very brave yet at this stage in her life. I'm not sure if that's going to change or not. But a lot of times, you know, Callie will bark at something, and then she will bark at that thing to kind of back Callie up. But as soon as she feels like you know, the rubber's gonna hit the road, she'll run away. So she's not the not the boldest dog out there, but that's all right. She's still, you know, little. I keep thinking when she's full grown, maybe she'll get a little bit braver. Uh, but you know, time will tell on that. Anyway, back to calving. So far, things have settled down a bit, I guess I would say. I know there in the beginning, it seemed like it was just like everything that could happen was happening twins pulling a calf um you know it i feel like i was getting tested and i should have known i should have known the minute i pulled my chute out of the corral and had a temporary setup i should have known that it was going to be one of those years but you know it it is what it is fortunately i do have the temporary setup and i have needed to use it as you guys have seen but I think the last big issue that I had was pulling the calf out of number 33. And she's still doing well. I, I honestly was a little bit worried about her because that was a really tough pull. But she seems like she's bounced back from it just fine. And uh, I'm not worried about her moving forward. Since then, we've had several more calves. I think the best that I've done this year is getting three calves on the same day that was a couple days ago uh yesterday we got two so we they've they've kind of been coming in spurts we'd have um like a day go by where we don't get any and then we'll get two or then we get three and you know that's just kind of how it goes i think as we get into the mid 20s and beyond that we're going to really start slowing down um, there will be a period during calving season where it's not uncommon for me to get one a day, maybe two a day. Uh, the most I've ever gotten in a single day is five, which I don't really expect that to ever happen again. But um, we'll, we'll probably start to taper off a little bit as you know we get all these calves on the ground. Uh, we've got, we're up to 21 now, but that includes bottle calves, so that includes twins. Of course, we've had two cows that lost their calves. So we've had 23 cows in total that have had calves. And I think altogether we've got 36 that were bred this year. So we've still got a little ways to go, but we're, we're getting through it. And every time a new calf hits the ground, it's always a surprise as to what color it's going to be. Uh, I'm not planning to do DNA samples on these calves. Like I say, most of them, their color kind of gives away who the sire is. And uh, the ones that are black are the only ones that we don't really know. And I'm not, it doesn't really matter that much at this point, which one they came out of. I think the replacement heifers that I'll keep out of this group will probably all, I mean, just, it's hard to say now, because we don't know what they're gonna look like at weaning, but just based off of which cows have had heifers, which calves look nice, which cows I know have you know good genetics that I would wanna keep in the herd. I think most of the replacement heifers this year will be out of rivet just because 
those are the ones that, that I like. And, you know, it's easy to tell who the sire is on those. So in the future, we would know which breeding group they could go into. But speaking of, uh, well, I was going to say speaking of DNA testing, although what I'm about to say really has nothing to do with DNA, but it, it does have something to do with uh, sending blood in and getting it tested. But I think this year I would like to try the Bioprin uh, program method. I'm, I'm not really sure what you call it, but uh, what that is, Bioprin is a company that you they'll I think they mail you a kit where you take blood samples from your cattle after breeding and then you can send the blood samples back into them and they will tell you if the cows are bred or not and I I think with the AeroQuip shoot having the vet cage doing something like that would be a lot easier than it would have been in the past and that's what kind of made it to where I didn't really want to do it in years past just because it would have been a pain to like jump in and out of that alleyway all day long. Um, but I think I've always wanted to preg check and it just to have a vet come out and do it. That really just never appealed to me because just like getting a vet out here is not always the easiest thing. And, and this is a relatively small herd, so I'm not even sure that they would want to come out. For something this size but i think uh, using bioprin would be uh, a good route for me to go the big disadvantage with doing blood samples is that you can't make a decision right then and there as to whether you're culling that cow or whether you're going to keep her you have to wait till you get your results back before you can make that decision that's not a huge deal to me um, what i like about it is I think doing a blood test to determine pregnancy is going to be more accurate than a palpation. Although the guys that palpate are, are good at it. And uh, if you were using someone in dairy country that is doing this every single day, they're probably really good at it. But we really don't have a lot of dairies up in this part of California anymore. So I'm not sure about trying to, you know, it just seems like a lot of, problems to figure out to get a vet to come out here and do that and doing bioprint would just be easier so <laughs> there we go so i see some people asking in the chat about um like useful lifespan of cattle and bulls uh the the cows that is kind of tougher to say because a lot of different things will influence that i've had cows here that got so old that they actually started turning gray i i remember a couple years ago i had a black cow she was all black and the last like two or three years that i had her her coat started turning gray and so i i'm not sure how old she would have been i would say like probably close to 20 years old um, and if a cow is doing everything that you want her to do year in and year out, there's really no reason to get rid of her. And honestly, in this setup, th my, my cows don't really live in a very demanding environment. We're not running on huge acreages of, you know, a hundred thousand acre range or anything like that, where they got to travel miles every day to get feed. These cows really have the good life. I mean, they've got a bunch of feed right at their feet they don't i mean they don't travel very far they don't they're not in hill country even so they they really have it pretty easy here what i'm saying is that their lifespan <laughs> or their useful life for me is, is longer probably than what it would be for someone that's in a little bit of more demanding country so what will cause me to get rid of a cow would be uh, usually just if she doesn't have a calf and you know what could cause that is a whole a whole list of things as long as the cows are having calves they have a good disposition I I keep them uh, I do have one cow out here that you'll probably see in the next video that is an extremely heavy milker and that is something that can get you on the coal list when it gets to a point like probably kind of where she's at 
She makes so much milk that during the early stages of the calf's life, it, it just cannot keep up with her. And her bag gets so big. I mean, she looks like a dairy cow. The trade-off for that is that once the calf gets a little bit older and it can utilize all that milk that she raises a really big calf, but in the early stages of the calf's life, I do, I kind of feel bad for her just because her bag is so big. She kicks it when she walks and, you know, I don't really like to see that, but as long as the calf can figure out how to nurse on it, I've had cows in the past where their bags were so big. I just knew I was going to have to help the calf figure out how to nurse. And so far I haven't had to do that with this cow. And she just had her calf a couple days ago. And I can tell that he, he did figure out how to nurse on her. So we're going to be good for another year with her, but that is something that I'm keeping an eye on. And when we do get later in the year and it's time to make those decisions about who's going to stay and who's going to go, then, you know, she might find herself on that list. <clears throat> Useful life for bulls is quite a bit shorter. Unfortunately, in the conventional model, uh, you would usually use a bull for two to three years, and that kind of depends on management practices. If you use a bull beyond two years, then you stand a chance of him breeding his own daughters. The way that you could get around that is if you bred your heifers to a separate bull, then you could get three years out of the same bull without them breeding their daughters. And that's the whole reason why I want to do this method of splitting the herd for breeding purposes. Because if I do that, then I can, I can extend the time that I keep Rivet and Little Boy on this ranch without having any inbreeding by several years. I mean, as much money as these bulls cost now, and Jeremy always gives me a good deal, but still, it's just such a shame to send them down the road after you've only had them for two years and they've still got plenty of working years left in them. Um, so that's, that's really the big motivation for me doing that is just so that I can get a few more years out of my bulls because Normally what happens to bulls when you're done with them, if you take them to the auction, they're going straight into the food supply. So they're just going to make hamburger out of them. And it seems like such a shame when they're still fairly young and they still have useful years ahead of them. <clears throat> Another thing that I could do, and I would probably try to do, is try to find somebody that wants to buy the bulls for breeding but again, that gets difficult because the, the big producers are gonna wanna buy younger bulls. It, it would really be sort of a niche market of people that would wanna buy bulls that were already several years old. So I think splitting the breeding herd, while it's not ideal, there are some drawbacks to doing that, but I think that there are more benefits. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm not used to talking this much. I got to drink water. <laughs> I did see someone ask if uh, the Bismarck bull is going to breed the heifers this year. And that is the plan. He is supposed to be a Cavanese bull. So I think that's what we'll do with him. But I am kicking around a new idea that... Uh, that I'll run by you guys now, see what you think, because I was thinking about this the other day. If I split the herd for breeding, put Rivet with roughly half, Little Boy with roughly the other half, then just the way that I would have to do that, and it's hard to explain really without you kind of being here and seeing how this all works, but the cattle have to move in a certain way so that I can irrigate the grass behind them. And in order to split the herd into two herds and do that, I wouldn't have anywhere to keep the Bismarck bull and the three heifers that I want him to breed this year. So I just kept thinking about, you know, the different ways that we could work around that. One thing is I, 
I could just get rid of the Bismarck bull, put the heifers with uh, one of the herd bulls that we have now and kind of see what happens. I know uh, Rivet is a Cavanese bull and he's got the EPDs to back that up. Little boy, I don't have an EPD sheet on, but I have not seen any monster calves this year. In fact, I think Little Boy throws smaller calves than Rivet. I have no way of knowing that for sure, but a lot of these black calves have come out very small. So I think they would be okay breeding heifers, but it is kind of nice having a third bull just in case one of them has a problem. Then we would have a backup that's just immediately ready to go. But getting back to what I was saying, just the management of all that, how do I keep everybody separated? Well, I think what I'm going to end up doing is sending Bismarck and the three heifers and all the steers to the steer pasture and leave the Bismarck bull and the heifers up there with the steers probably at least through the summer and then bringing them back in the fall like whenever I have to start feeding hay up there is probably when I would bring them back. But if I do that, I've got plenty of feed up here. That's kind of the reason why this idea is attractive to me is because sending the number of steers that I send up there, uh, we usually end up having to mow that pasture at least once over the summer just because they can't keep up with it. So sending a few more head up there would kind of help uh, solve that problem. And, and we might even get to a point where we don't have to mow and kind of find that equilibrium of, I think, Honestly, <clears throat> I think it'll still be too much feed for them, which is good because I want the steers to just have everything they can possibly eat. And I'm okay with the heifers and the Bismarck bull having that same opportunity because they, they all need to grow still. So that's probably what I'll end up doing. I might change my mind though. I have a tendency to do that if I think of something that I like better. So we'll see. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I always grab with the wrong finger here. What are we doing here? So, yeah, the concern being three, three heifers and a bunch of steers and a bull, I don't think it'll be too much of an issue uh, when the heifers go into heat. Yeah, the, the, steers, the steers pay attention to that, but it doesn't drive them crazy like it does a bull, is w at least what I've noticed. Like, I see Buddy out there detecting heats, but he's not riding them. He's not crashing through fences to get to them. But you can tell, you know, he he follows them around. And, and you know, if you got one in heat out there, he he maybe that should be his new job, heat detector. <laughs> but I think that the Bismarck bull is probably going to shut any of that down. And, and I guess that would be the concern is that he spends all his time fighting with those steers, trying to keep them off the heifers. And, you know, but I got to believe a young bull finds a way to get them bred because, you know, they're, they're good at that. <laughs> yeah, so Chris runs steers and heifers and bulls together, no issues. That's good to know. Um, so, yeah, that is kind of the plan. For that and the, the only thing I guess my my big worry with that beyond all like the the social issues that 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 group could have the bigger concern is just having a, a bull up there and if he you know would like smell some neighboring cattle going into heat and want to break out I mean the fences are pretty good up there uh, and there's really I can't off the top of my head, think of any cattle that are very close. There are some kind of on the way there that maybe if the wind was going just right, he might be able to de detect a heat that far away. But I, I think the other cattle that are in that area are up there seasonally. So they're using, you know, the neighboring cattle, at least they're using that as winter pasture. So when the Bismarck bull gets moved up there, those other neighboring cattle should be gone, and I think we'll be all right. I just saw in the chat, and this is a question I get a lot, so I, I'm going to answer it, but people ask, like, what is 
the long-term plan with Buddy or what what are we doing with him? Uh, a lot of people suggest that he needs to, to go to processing and, and go to the freezer. The thing about that is that he is like five years old now, I think. So when, when cattle pass, I think, 36 months of age or when steers pass 36 months of age, they can no longer grade prime because as they get older, the, the meat quality goes down. And uh, <clears throat> so because of that, the, the age that he is now, if like, let's just say we did send him to processing, all we could really do is make hamburger out of him or maybe jerky. That's not the plan though. I don't think we will ever do that because, you know, he, he's just become a pet. You know, my wife likes him, my kids like him. Uh, I think I would have a lot of people mad at me if I did that. So Buddy will be just sort of the ranch mascot, heat detector. Uh, I can put him in with bulls, you know, if, if I have like a single bull that I need to take out or something like that. There are things that we can use Buddy for that have a little bit of use to me. But, you know, if we're just being honest, he's a pet. And, you know, you wouldn't send your dog off to have that done to him. And, and we wouldn't do that to Buddy either. So that is, that's the story with him. I know some people are going to think that I'm uh, foolish for doing that or that's missed income or missed opportunity. But, you know, there, there is value in, in having a pet or like a, an ambassador for <laughs> the beef industry, I guess we could call him. Not to mention, I think a lot of you guys would be mad at me if I did that, too. <laughs> yeah, Buddy is, uh, he might not be bigger than Rivet now, but he was for a while. Uh, he was, I think the last time I weighed him, he was like 1,600 pounds. And Rivet, I think, has a matched in weight, but when you look at him, Buddy looks a little bit taller. Uh, I haven't seen them stand next to each other in a while now that I got the bulls separated. So I'm not really sure what what status we're at now, but uh, I, I definitely think Rivet is stronger because he may not be real tall at the shoulder, but, I mean, you've seen him. He's just, he's built. He's just a, a big old bag of muscle is, is pretty much all he is. <laughs> Another thing that I wanted to mention in this live stream and that it, it goes to a comment that I got a couple weeks ago and it was about how I refer to my steers as harvest steers <clears throat> and the commenter was very upset with me for doing that and um, because normally you would hear people call them butcher steers, slaughter steers. But the reason that I refer to them on camera as harvest steers is because I was advised once by someone that I respected that when you're talking about that class of cattle that you should refer to them as harvest steers. And this is absolutely politically correct speech. It just sounds a little bit nicer. It doesn't really change what is going to ultimately happen to those guys. But you got to remember, the beef industry is often under attack and nobody sees it more than people that raise cattle on YouTube because we get some pretty nasty comments of, you know, <clears throat> there, there for some reason is this stigma that if you raise animals that you're mean to them, you don't care about them, all these ridiculous notions that people have. And when I'm making videos and putting them on YouTube, I don't know who's going to watch them. Odds are, I mean, most, I think most of the people that watch my videos raise animals as well. And you don't really need to like sugarcoat a term like that for them. <clears throat> but you don't know who's watching. And, and like it or not, when you speak or represent the beef industry on YouTube, 
you are kind of the face of that in that moment for whoever's watching you. So while I, I don't necessarily call them harvest steers off camera, I make an effort to do that on camera because I think it just sort of portrays the beef industry in a better light. And you may not like the whole politically correct stuff. I don't necessarily like that either. But just because I don't like it doesn't mean that it's just poof goes away. You know, I mean, we have to live in the world of reality, right? And if calling them harvest steers influences someone in a, in a positive way, even though I may never know it, then I think it's something that's worth doing. Uh, the guy that advised me to do this was uh, my one of my professors at Chico. And if, if you're from this area, you would probably know who it is. <clears throat> and he gives a lot of speeches. He, you know, is in the Cattlemen's Association and all that stuff. And because he addresses the public about the beef industry on a regular basis, and he suggested that this was a good thing to do, I took that advice and I've tried to run with it. And, you know, I guess it does, it makes some of the purists upset because that's not what they call them. Uh, but that's why I do it. So I, hopefully that makes sense. I know, like I say, someone out there did not like that, but that's why I do it. <laughs> All right, I wanna run through here. I know, um, I know when I do these live streams that I miss a lot of questions and I also know that that makes people mad. Um, and you got to remember, I'm doing this by myself. I don't have moderators or anything like that. So if I, if I miss your question, I'm not ignoring you, but I have learned something about myself. And that is that when I'm trying to read the chat and talk, it doesn't work. <laughs> so I kind of have to just look away from it and say what I'm going to say so that I can speak a little bit better than trying to read and talk at the same time. It's very difficult to do. Um, so the shoot, I did see someone ask about the new AeroQuip shoot. Unfortunately, it's still sitting over here on blocks. You can actually see it right, uh, right in the background over my shoulder here, right, right there. Uh, I'm just waiting on that slab. And like I mentioned before, I'm going to pour the concrete on Friday. And that is, uh, that's really the thing that's holding us back. And then I got to let that concrete cure to a certain extent, you know, or to a certain point before I can put the chute on there. If I was just slamming the chute on there, I could probably put it on the concrete relatively fast, but because I'm putting the load bars for the scale, which then requires me to drill holes into the slab to put the anchors in, I, I feel like I really need it to cure completely before I do that because as much work as it has been, to get this slab set up and poured. I'm not even done with it yet, but it, it already feels like it's been a ton of work. I don't wanna have to do any of this over again. I want this to be the last slab that I pour for that shoot. So that, that's why I went the extra mile and tore out the old slab because I just knew that I wouldn't be happy with it. And by the way, a lot of people asked, why not just pour the new slab on top of the old one? And the reason that I didn't do that is because it would make the new slab too tall. So the way I've got it set up now, the new slab will be at the exact same height as the old one. It'll just be smoother and more level. And that was the big problem that I had with the old one is that it was not level. So when you put the load bars, when you bolted those to the chute, the chute gets everything like leveled out on the same plane, right? So now you try to set that down on uneven ground and the whole thing tips back and forth. Well, if you know anything about scales, you know this is the best way to make a scale not accurate is to have it sitting on an unlevel surface where it can rock back and forth. It'll never read right. So what I had done is I just shimmed it up and I felt like that got it pretty close. But, um, you know... It, it, it would be so much nicer to just have it on a level slab where 
it's not going to, you know, I might have to shim it a little bit. I understand that just to get it perfect, but I won't have to shim it near as much as I did on the old one. The old one needed like over an inch of shim on one corner. It was so bad. So we're, we're getting away from that, but that's, that's why I didn't want to mess around with just pouring a slab on top of, um, the old one. So you see that how I just tripped over my words. It's cause I was reading a comment, but I will answer that now. And, uh, sorry, I missed your name, but I saw what you asked is which other farming channels do I watch on YouTube? And there are a handful and I'm going to feel really bad if I miss any that I watch, but, um, and let's be clear. I watch a bunch, but like my can't miss channels would probably be uh, country view acres. I don't think I miss any of Evan's videos. Uh, Luthy Ranch is another one. Rip Ranch. <coughs> uh, these uh, Luthy and Rip Ranch are both a little bit smaller channels. Uh, Rip Ranch is my friend Carson that I've talked about before. Um, started out as my contact at Redmond, but we've kind of just become friends over the last couple of years dealing with each other. Um, what else? We, we grab sunny farms every once in a while, just a few acres farm with Pete. Uh, oh, I feel like I'm forgetting someone. Shoot. <laughs> if it pops into my head, I'll let you know. But, um, yeah, I don't want to leave anybody out, you know, because I know how much work it takes to get videos on YouTube. So, um, yeah, Sleep Ranch, that's another one I've been watching. Uh, Our Wyoming Life and Beyond the Ranch, we've been watching those here. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. There's actually a lot of good channels out there, which is pretty cool. Because I don't know about you guys, we do not watch TV, like, anymore. And we used to, but uh, pretty much everything that I watch now is, is on YouTube. Just because... I, it's just so cool to me that you can sit down and just think, I want to watch a video about whatever you can think of. You type it in and, and there it is, you know. And I just feel like YouTube doesn't have all the messages that mainstream TV has now, which, you know, yeah. So we're, we're pretty much a YouTube family now. And uh, I, th I think a lot of people are moving that way, at least probably a lot of you because you're here. So you obviously watch YouTube. I feel like anyone that starts watching YouTube, it's not long before that's, that's all they watch anymore. <laughs> so a lot of people asked uh, uh, on the video, Belly. I don't know. Sorry. If you, if you guys can't hear that, Belly is growling and barking at something right now. I'm not sure what. But um, anyway, people were asking after I pulled the calf out of number 33, is uh, was I going to try to graft one of the bottle calves onto her? And that is something that I, I did think about doing. If I was going to do it, I, I should have probably done it like immediately. And honestly, at this point, it's not really something that I'm considering doing several reasons for that the first one being that feeding the bottle calves has kind of become a family event that we do every morning and every evening and I think it would make my daughter sad if we sent one of the bottle calves back here to the ranch <clears throat> so yes this is a business and profitability is the primary focus but sometimes uh, learning, you know, and involving the family takes precedent over that. And this is kind of one of those things. She's at a perfect age to where, you know, she's learning what it takes to take care of an animal. And I think there's a lot of value in that. It's, it's a lot harder to quantify. You don't get it in the form of a check, but I think that it is useful. Now, yeah, we have two of them over there. And she could learn everything from one that she can learn from two. I get that. But I also think that it, it's good 
for the calves to have each other. You know, cattle are herd animals. They don't want to be stuck out there by themselves. And yeah, you know, we try to go out there and spend time with them when we can. But, you know, realistically, how, how much time can you spend out there, you know? <coughs> so there's that aspect of it. And then the other aspect of it is that cow 33, while she was a pretty good patient when I had her up in the chute, I also can't forget about all the trouble that she has caused me in the past. Now, if you raise animal or cattle specifically, I'm sure this is true with pretty much any herd animal, but when you're raising cattle, you know that every herd has that cow that ruins everything. And what I mean by that is that let's say I'm getting them all walking back into the working corral. We got to vaccinate or whatever we got to do that day. Number 33 is the one that right as things are going well, she picks her head up and decides to run back the other way, wrecks the whole flow, everybody, and, and you got to start all over. So <laughs> every herd has a cow like that, and she is mine. Uh, I know I often complain about number 20 or saying that she's wild, but she actually works pretty good up until you get her in the tub, and then she doesn't like to go in the chute. I think the AeroQuip's going to help her a lot. But number 33 is difficult to even get back there. And when you have one cow that misbehaves, she emboldens everybody else to do the same thing. So what I'm getting around to saying is that up till now, other than that, I've never had a reason to cull her because she always had a calf and always raised her calf. But now th this might be a, a good reason to send her down the road and I have mixed feelings about it just because, you know, she did breed up. She, I guess really what happened to her probably wasn't her fault, but at the end of the day, you know, we got to, we need to make something off of her for the year. And because she's got kind of a bad attitude and she lost her calf, those two things together would probably be enough to, to kind of make the decision easy. And I know it sounds a little harsh, but that's just the way it is. Yes, Kathy Smith is right. She did look a little crazy when I let her out of the chute. I always wonder if that translates to camera because a lot of times I'll be filming a cow and oh boy, she got a bad attitude. And then I'm watching the film back and it's like, man, uh, she doesn't look that crazy on camera at all. But I don't know, there was something about the way she was looking at me. She looked like she had, uh, she had ill intentions. We'll put it that way. <laughs> All right, let me run through the chat here. Let's see. Yeah, grafting calves does need to be done right away. I agree with that. And I've done it in the past. Uh, it is in the long run you, it does save you some work for sure and it saves you money too because milk replacer for the calves is not cheap either um but you know grafting can can happen pretty quickly or it can take like over a week to get done so you just you just don't know um <clears throat> Oh, somebody asked, that's funny because Macy asks me, my daughter Macy asks me this all the time is where's Buddy's mom? Well, Buddy's mom, uh, she actually died a few years ago. If you guys remember, we were having a really bad pneumonia outbreak in the herd and we lost several cows and Buddy's mom happened to be one of those. So, uh, yeah, she was number 35. I don't know why I remember that, but that's uh, that's what happened with her so she's no longer with us but she lives on through that that big red lawnmower out there <laughs> okay chuck s that's 
he asked if there's any plans for a temporary corral at the steer pasture. And this is something I think about a lot because I really feel like I need that. Um, if I had a good way to load cattle over there, I, I think I would use that pasture a lot differently. Uh, so here's, here's the, the issues, the problems that I deal with as far as that goes. <clears throat> what, what I learned the first year taking the steers over there, the first year I took 10 over and that I had to take them over in two trips and I had to bring them back in two trips. Taking them over is fine. That's not a big deal at all. But when you got to take them back, you know, I couldn't fit 10 of those guys in the trailer when they were full, full grown. So I had to do like five and five or four and six or however it was. Um, and the problem with that is that you need a corral system in which you can split them. Now, I did figure out how to do that with the janky panels that I have over there. And thank goodness, none of them decided to try to jump one of those because if they did, they would have easily, maybe not cleared it, but they would have easily gotten out because what happens is when a cow is not agile enough to just clear a fence, what happens is they land on top of the fence, you know, basically on their belly. And those panels are so weak over there that they would just fold in half. And I've seen this happen before. That's how I know that that's how it's going to end. So to split them, I need a corral that I can split them in. Last year, I took seven steers over there knowing that I would be able to fit seven in the trailer to bring them all home at once so that when I loaded them, it would be a little bit easier. I could just load them all as one big group. I wouldn't have to cut them in half and that would be great. This year, if I do my idea that I'm considering doing, I'll, I'll end up taking between eight and 10 steers. Haven't quite decided yet on that, but let's just say eight. So take eight steers over there, three heifers, that makes 11, plus the bull makes 12. There's no way 12 of them are gonna fit in the trailer on the way home. So again, we need a corral where we can split them in half and do two loads of six or pull the heifers and the bull out in the fall. And again, this would require a corral where I could sort them, get the ones that I want, and then load. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so back to the original question, what are we going to do about a temporary corral there? Because something needs to happen. Something needs to improve. I, what I would like to do is set up a corral down where I have the feeder because that's like the only flat ground on that property. And it would just be a lot easier to get a good uh, temporary corral set up down there. The problem is that if you want to load out when it's muddy or wet, you can forget it because, well, you, you could probably drive down to the corral, but you'd never get out of there because it's uphill the whole way out. There was a time a uh, year before last, and I tried to take a bale down there in my truck when it was a little bit wet and I got down to the feeder and I couldn't get anywhere back towards the gate. I had to get towed out by a tractor. So I know that that, that ground gets pretty slippery when when it's wet. So I think that if, if I was able to set up a good temporary corral down on the flat down there, I could do that. I would just know that I'd be limited as to the times that I could get animals out of there. So if, if I like, let's say wanted to grab the heifers and the bull, I would just know that in the fall, whenever I want to do that, or, or maybe late summer would be safer because I would know that it would be dry, but I would just have to time that or schedule that around when it was going to be dry. So that's not ideal, but it could work. Um, and then just becomes the issue of getting panels, building panels. I mean, I don't know what the best route to go with that would be one of those uh, portable corrals would be cool. But again, you gotta pretty much have flat ground for those to work. Those are awesome, like when you're grazing crop residue and cornfield or whatever. 
because uh, you know the field's going to be mostly flat and it's easy to unfold those. But trying to unfold one of those portable corrals on uneven ground, I just I don't think it could happen. I I just don't think that would work. So if if I was to be able to get one of those, I would have to set it up down there on the flat ground. And then I could also probably use it at the winter pasture because that's pretty flat over there, or at least there are plenty of flat areas where it would work. So something like that maybe in the future would be cool to have, but I think more realistically in the immediate future, it's gonna be a panel corral. And I think that, you know, it's just the panels that you buy, the good ones are pretty expensive. And I know people have made like freestanding panels out of oil pipe and I might do that, but those are so heavy that you have to set them up with the tractor. So that's like a more permanent corral than like regular panels would be. So there's, there's a lot of choices. I, there's really not one that jumps out to me as like, that's the obvious choice. That's what we got to do. Um, and then there's always the cost, you know, you got to think about that because, you know, a lot of ideas would be awesome, but they might also be cost prohibitive too. And uh, building a, a whole portable corral like that, I just think would be so expensive. I don't, I don't know. It's something the, we got to do something over there though, because the way I'm doing it now, I just don't think that's a long-term setup because sooner or later we're going to have a wreck over there and it's going to be a mess and I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> so I see Arthur asking about the hay fields and that's uh, something that I've been keeping a close eye on because they're starting to get tall now. We're getting into the spring weather and I think, boy, probably about 80% of the growth happens, you know, the two months before you cut it. So they're, they're going like crazy now. <clears throat> There's part of the hay field that's right along the county road that's really easy for me to look at. And it's growing, but I will have to say it's got a lot of wild oats in it, which is not what I wanted. Um, those, I was intending to spray those out this year but the weather window just kind of never happened the way i needed it to to spray that chemical to get the wild oats the thing with that is so the the chemical that i was spraying to get rid of that is called simplicity but it is also kind of hard on the the stuff that you planted so like in this case triticale so you have to you have to find a window where the triticale is like six or so inches tall. Basically, you want it to have a good root system and to be like a hardy, vibrant plant or at, at that stage. And then you need to find a weather window where it's warm. If you spray that stuff and you're going to get a frost, then it can really kind of curl your triticale. So there's a pretty specific uh, crop condition and weather window that need to line up with each other and we just didn't get it this year. I did spray 2,4-D out there, which is a broadleaf killer to get like any thistles or any of that sort of thing taken care of, but the wild oats are alive and well out there, and it's not that the cows can't eat them. They're just not really desirable. They don't have a lot of uh, nutrition value in them by the time you cut and bale that. The problem is, is that they mature a lot earlier than that other stuff, so by the time you cut and bale it, you know, like, if I'm hitting the window where the triticale is perfect, the wild oats are already dead and, and then, you know, they're basically just straw at that point. <coughs> so the other part of the field where the wild oats were not as big of an issue is not close to the road. So it's really difficult for me to see. I think I will take my drone out there in the next couple of days and fly it down to just try to get a look at what's going on. But I know when I sprayed the field that that part that had the forage mix looked a lot better than the triticale. So I'm optimistic that 
I'll at least get some tonnage this year, which I didn't get last year. But I'm not sure what the quality is going to be, especially on, on the triticale. <clears throat> All right. We're probably going to wrap this up pretty soon because my voice is starting to go and we're at, looks like we just hit an hour. So, oh, the side-by-side, -side, that, that is something that I also wanted to talk about. I haven't done a thing with it yet. Um, I've been driving my other one around, which, so I've, I've had this other one since 2018, I think. Uh, we got this before we had kids and it was really more for like recreational use. Um, and I keep pointing at it because it's parked right next to me right there. <laughs> but we bought this. Prior to having kids, it was the one we took camping. We, uh, Bree and I used to take it out and just go ride for the day. And then since having kids, we just never really used it very much. And in fact, I came real close to selling it because we didn't use it that much. Um, but now I'm glad I, I hung on to it because it's, it's ended up being nice to have a backup. <clears throat> I, want, I need to get the Honda in the shop and start tearing it apart. I think I know what's wrong with it, but I won't know for sure until I tear into the motor and, and verify it, so, you know, because when it first broke down, I, I was, I was ready to jump on, start ordering parts. And, you know, I, I thought I knew what it needed. And then I kind of thought, well, maybe I better slow down here. Maybe I better tear it down and verify what it does and doesn't need. And then make a decision decision from there i was thinking about trying to get um a part supplier on board to like sponsor that rebuild to kind of help me out with the cost a little bit so i've tried to do this in the past when i rebuilt the four-wheeler they weren't interested in me then so i'm going to try it again now that the channel is a little bit bigger and we'll see uh they may not want to and that's fine but i just thought you know it'd be a good thing for me to try anyway but i think that side by side the honda was needing an engine rebuild anyway because i was noticing it was starting to use a lot of oil and it's uh the the thing about that engine transmission setup is the transmission and the engine actually share oil so that uh, when the engine oil gets low because the side-by-side's burning it, then the transmission starts not wanting to shift very well. So it was getting annoying, you know, not that you shouldn't check your oil all the time, but I was having to check it like every time I drove it because if it was too low, the thing could barely get out of second gear. Um, so I was, I've been knowing that it needs an engine rebuild, probably should do like the timing chain and a few other things while we're in there. Uh, I have adjusted the valves on it, but it would probably be smart to do that again as well. So we'll probably dive into that. And I do plan on filming that, but maybe not real in depth. I don't know. It's, uh, it's definitely a different type of content, although it is stuff that I have filmed in the past. So I'll probably end up filming it just, uh, just because, but I don't know how many people are going to want to watch it. We'll see. <laughs> So I kind of had a, I thought about, well, just getting rid of the Honda, driving the Yamaha from now on. But the thing about the Honda is so much better suited to doing the kind of work that I do with it. Like the welder fits in the back, all the tools fit in the back. The Yamaha is a great machine. And Actually, for going to the winter pasture, the Yamaha is a lot better because it goes faster and it's got much better suspension. It's a lot smoother ride, but the Honda's got a bigger bed and it's, you know, it's easier to fit tools in. It's got a bench seat, so it's easier for the dogs to ride up there. Uh, for a work rig, I like the Honda better. For a play rig, I like the Yamaha better. So uh, they, they can both do both, but they're definitely better suited for one or the other. <laughs> uh, 
And yes, I know, I'm very fortunate to, to have a backup side-by-side. -side. A lot of people would be happy just to have one. And uh, yeah. All right, I wanna to try to get a few more of these questions here just because it's, uh, I know, I see them popping up. Oh, okay, here's one that I also wanted to talk about. That's the Dodge flatbed. Uh, the plan, or the whole reason I got the Dodge <clears throat> was for hauling hay back here to the barn and that is still what I would like to do with it. Although, like with so many things, <laughs> there are a couple issues that we gotta kinda think about. I did order some parts for that truck, actually, just some basic tune-up stuff. Uh, you know, obviously wanna change the oil, fuel filters, just do a cap and rotor, spark plugs, kind of the basic stuff. Uh, fuel line, maybe do an electric fuel pump. I know a lot of people suggested that. Uh, carburetor rebuild, you know, just kind of spruce it up, get it to where it's, I mean, it runs pretty good now, but I think we could make it run better and be a little bit more reliable after all, if I'm going to be hauling the hay. Belly, what are you doing here? I'm not, sorry. I know <laughs> I suddenly get distracted because things are happening that you guys can't see. For some reason, Belly thought she needed to squeeze in between my uh, camera stand and my leg, but anyway. So if I'm gonna use the truck for hauling bales, it needs to be somewhat reliable because if it's just causing problems, then while it might be able to haul more, I could move bales faster with the Ford because you know it potentially wouldn't. So we wanna try to make it reliable. <clears throat> the thing that I'm a little iffy about is the tires. They look good but they are old and sometimes old tires even when they look good can blow out on you and we don't want that especially with a full load of hay and then the other uh issue or or thing that i'm a little bit worried about with that truck is that the the receiver hitch on it is really tall so in order to hook the hay trailer up to that truck we would need like a drop hitch that goes way down and <clears throat> if you know much about towing you know the further down your drop hitch goes the more leverage your trailer has on it and the more potential for failure failure you have especially with hauling heavy loads so when i get that hay trailer loaded up it's probably close to ten thousand pounds in total so already pulling that on a bumper hitch is a lot. And if you put a big drop on the hitch, I I don't know. It seems a little iffy. I have seen people build custom hitches that have like strut bars kind of holding it down low like that. Um, I'll have to look at the back of that flatbed a little bit better to see if it's gonna be smarter to, to add a different hitch or to build a drop hitch or you know, ho however we want to deal with that, because if I can't pull the trailer with that truck, then it's not really worth it to even use it because I can fit more bales on the trailer than I can on the truck. The goal is to, you know, with truck and trailer together, I could move 25 bales at a time, which would reduce my hay hauling by a really significant margin because I think I was only moving 15 or 16 uh, yeah, 15 on that trailer by itself. So we would, we would cut the trips by quite a bit. So, and that's like the whole motivation for doing this. But if that truck can't pull the trailer then it can't move that many, then it can only move 10 at a time. And then it would just be better to pull the trailer with the Ford. So we might end up doing a little bit of both. Um, so we'll, time, time will tell on that. And then, like I say, we got to, we got to look at the tires and I would kind of like to just load that truck up, you know, put 10 bales on the bed and just see how it handles it. I did move some big rice straw bales with it and it, it did fine. Although it did make some new 
kind of creaking noises that it didn't make before. So <laughs> we, we might have to, uh, to look at that. But ideally, that's what we would end up doing is pulling the trailer with the Dodge, moving 25 bales all at once. And I might do that one time and say, no way, we're not doing this again. Oh, the other thing that truck needs is a trailer brake controller because right now it doesn't have one and I'm not going to move that much weight on a trailer with no trailer brakes. That would just be not a good idea. I'm sure the truck's a 1974, so I'm sure the brakes don't work <clears throat> anywhere near as good as what a modern vehicle would anyway. So to try to move weight like that without trailer brakes, no, I'm not doing it. Maybe someone out there will do it, but it's not me. <laughs> so, and you know, I keep telling myself too, we, we might just move hay with the Ford this year and you know, the Dodge isn't going anywhere. Uh, there's always next year. I, I really thought I would be a lot further with it than I am. You know, you always think you're gonna have all this time to get things ready for the future. And it just doesn't ever seem to work out that way because uh, other things come up that are more pressing that need to get done right away. I mean, I was just noticing the other day the video of me bringing home the arrow equips like over a month old now. I thought I would have that thing set up in two weeks and here we are over a month later. And I mean, we're getting close, but we're still not there yet. So it's just kind of the way it goes. You know, and then with calving going on right now, um, that that occupies a lot of time in the day. I'm checking them two, maybe three times a day, depending. Uh, especially if I if I know I've got something going on, then I'll uh, go back and and check three or maybe even four times a day, just because we don't want to have any sort of a repeat like we did with number 33, uh, which that stuff like that is rare. I always say twins are rare, but I've, I've got a twinning gene in this herd. So it, we've already had two sets of twins this year. We've only got 36 cows that are bred. I don't know what the percentage is on that, but it's pretty high. I talk to a lot of guys that run hundreds of cows that have never had twins before. So for me to almost guarantee gonna get one set in a year, to get two is just crazy. I think I have gotten three sets of twins in the same year as the most I've ever had. So it wouldn't shock me if it happens again. Um, I think usually the twins come earlier, you know, because probably room's getting tight and mama's body says it's time to spit these things out. So hopefully we are, we're done with twins for this year. But if we're not, because there's no way to know for sure, if we're not, I want to make sure that I catch them early. Because this year I've been lucky and I've been able to catch the twins. Uh, Smokey, the little gray one, was probably close to 24 hours before we caught him. Thank goodness. I, I believe full heartedly that he nursed on his mother. Or he wouldn't have been that healthy. And it's a good thing he did because if he didn't, he probably would have died out there. Littles, our black twin, I knew uh, within a couple hours after he was born that um, that he was a twin. So it was, <clears throat> excuse me. So the result for him was good. And, you know, he had all that trouble with his uh, selenium deficiency walking, you know, with his feet kind of messed up so it was again a good thing that I found him early because he's he's doing awesome now in fact I was watching him this morning and I couldn't hardly tell that anything was wrong with his feet you know so he's kind of grown out of that and I think just time and nursing um, even though he's not getting mama's milk which I'll I'll be a firm believer for all my life that there's nothing better than that but the milk replacer that we give him with the Redmond, I forget what it is, the first 30 days, I think is what, it's, I think it is called first month or first, it's probably called first month. That's a more catchy name than first 30 days. <laughs> but <clears throat> between what we're giving him, 
they're both doing really well. And um, now we've kind of taken to running around with them in that pen. And, and part of that is just kind of fun for all of us to do with the calves. But the other part of doing that is that it's really good for that calf that had the selenium deficiency to exercise and run. I think the more he eats, the older he gets, and the more he moves around, that is just, that's the best way for him to get over the sort of issues that he's got going. Looks like we've got a helicopter going over. I don't know if you guys can hear that. All right, I keep saying one more, one more, but I'll just grab this last question. Am I looking to get more land? Yes and no. It It's uh, pasture is very difficult to, to come by around here. And it what usually happens is if you do find it, it's pretty far away. So we've already got uh, the home ranch here, the winter pasture and the steer pasture. So there's, there, there's three places right there that I'm going between. If I was to rent another place, it would have to be pretty close to home. Otherwise, I just I think I'd just be in my truck all the time, just driving around to all the different places. And, um, you know, you can't grow if you don't have more land. But, you know, there's there's a lot of things to consider or I guess, you know, more things to consider than I guess it seems like on the surface. So it i'm not opposed to it certainly but it would have to kind of be the right situation um i might be more inclined to get more hay ground uh, but again you know there there are things to consider just because all my, all of my uh groundwork equipment is small so you know having to move that all around i don't know it's a lot of things to to weigh you know my gut reaction to that is, of course, we're looking for more land. We always, you know, we're always thinking, how can we grow? How can we improve? But, you know, at, at what cost is also kind of what it boils down to. It's, I try to not jump into things like that without really thinking it over from many different angles, potential problems, potential benefits, and weighing it all out and just trying not to just go off of, you know, your knee jerk reaction, which might be ultimately the wrong one. Um, and I know this drives my wife crazy sometimes because I just, I think a thing to death before I make a decision. But I think that's probably helped me more than it's hurt me. I, I will we'll put it that way. I could be wrong, but <laughs> that's how I'm gonna think about it anyway, so. <laughs> All right, well, I've got some other things that I need to do today. You guys are going to see it in a video on Thursday, I think, because, yeah, to, what I'm filming today should should go into the video for Thursday. And I will see you all then. I appreciate everybody for hanging out in the live stream. I've been watching out of the corner of my eye the, the number of people in the chat here and... That's pretty good. We're at 675 right now. I think it was at 700 during certain parts. So I really appreciate you guys listening to me talk at you for a little over an hour here. So, so again, I appreciate it. I'm trying to do more of these. I think the more I do them, the better I'll, I'll at least get at the technical part of getting everything set up and going. And, you know, I try to have some topics prepared to talk about i know it's not a lot of fun to just watch me quietly scrolling through the comments so we'll fine tune this we'll get it a little bit better and i still am planning to maybe do these like every other week or when i miss a video so that's the other thing i know a lot of people get mad and say they didn't know the live stream was coming well if i ever miss a scheduled video you can bet that there will be a live stream that afternoon. So check the community post and I'll tell you what time it's going to be. And that's, uh, that's what we'll do from here on out. <laughs> so thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you on the next one.